Welcome, fellow monarchists. Um, so I was preparing to come here today, I was thinking about um, one of my favorite wildlife artists from the part of the Mississippi coast that I'm from, a man named Walter Anderson. Um, he has a great line about uh, you know, what he thought about when he was painting birds and butterflies. He said, each one is a hole in the sky through which we can get a glimpse of heaven. I think that's a pretty nice line. And you know, we're uh, in a great place to get that glimpse right now because um, here we are with you know, the, the migration, the fall migration of monarchs uh, still in full swing. And San Antonio, as you can see from this map right at the center of it, as the nation's first monarch butterfly champion city. So pretty big deal. Um, as some of you may know, the National Wildlife Federation named us the country's first monarch butterfly champion city thanks to Major, Mayor I Ivy Taylor signing the mayor's monarch pledge last December. And this had, uh, what was it, Monica, 24 parts that had to be completed? Yeah, some cities did four, some cities did six. Some did three, some did eight. San Antonio did 26. That's so. amazing. It was interesting okay. because uh, in working with them, they didn't have a category for that. They didn't anticipate that anybody would do all of the things. And so when Ruben Lizalde here and the mayor, Mayor Taylor, announced that they would do that, there was a scrambled conference call, is my understanding, and they had to come up with a new category. <laughs> and so we're, we're category busters in San Antonio. <laughs> um, I understand we have some representatives from the Wildlife Federation here today. Could you please stand? Yeah. Thank you. Hey. Uh, I ran into uh, Mayor, Taylor, uh, the, uh, Mayor Taylor at uh, Rackspace earlier this week. She was very sorry that she wasn't going to be able to be here uh, this evening, but she did send a little video greeting to us, which we'll show now. Hello and welcome everyone. I'm sorry I couldn't join you in person today, but via video I still feel like I'm part of San Antonio's inaugural Monarch Butterfly Festival at the Pearl and Mexican Cultural Institute. Last December, I signed the Mayor's Monarch Pledge and made San Antonio the nation's first Monarch Butterfly Champion City, recognized by the National Wildlife Federation. I couldn't have imagined the amazing impact that distinction has had on our students, families, community, and on the monarch population. I'd like to extend a special welcome to our distinguished visitors, panelists, and guests from around the city, state, nation, and beyond. It's our pleasure to host you this weekend as the first Monarch Butterfly and Pollinator Festival takes flight. The festival includes a weekend of art, science, citizen science, and celebration of the magnificent monarch butterfly migration that binds our three countries in North America, Canada, the United States, and Mexico. The migration moves each year through the San Antonio area as the butterflies migrate north from Mexico to lay the first generation of eggs on local milkweed plants. They continue their journey through the Midwest over multiple generations all the way to Canada, where in late summer and early fall, they turn south to Mexico where they return to roost for the winter. Preserving this unique annual miracle is a goal we all share, and we're working hard to ensure that future generations can enjoy the magic of monarchs moving through town. We invite you to enjoy your stay, the beautiful artwork offered by the Instituto Cultural, the interesting symposium at the Pearl Studio, and the parade and festivities that will take place alongside the farmer's market at the Pearl. I can't think of a better symbol of the bonds we share as people and as nations than the monarch butterfly. Thank you for making the trip. Now at the migration we'll be talking about this evening. I have a little video clip on that.
Speaking of beautiful, uh, we hope that many of you were able to make it over to the uh, Mexican Cultural Institute at Hemisphere last night for the uh, opening of the Monarch Butterfly Art Show. Um, I think we have a few folks from the uh, Institute here tonight. Would you stand, please? In other words, there she is. <laughs> Thank you. And if you weren't able to make it last night, you'll have other chances because it will be there until January. Um, and we hope you'll take in the festival tomorrow, which includes a pollinator parade starting at uh, 9 a.m. right here at the Pearl, at the corner of Pearl Parkway and Carn Street, right across from uh, the Southerly Restaurant. Um, none of this would be possible without our volunteers and sponsors. So we'd like to thank the San Antonio River Authority, HEB, the Pearl, the Rivard Report, the Hispanic Chamber of Commerce, the Own a Bike Co-op, the Institute of Mexican Culture, the Mayor's Office, Trinity University, the Texas Butterfly Ranch, and the John and Florence Newman Foundation. Uh, would representatives of those organizations and our volunteers please stand? <laughs> We'd also like to welcome City Councilman Robert Trevino, who has joined us this evening. Councilman? A big supporter. And now to our panel. We hope to have a lively discussion illustrated by a few slides, as you can see. And you know, the presidential debates have gotten such good ratings that uh, I have encouraged everybody to just jump in spontaneously and say, did so, did not. But we're gonna keep the trash talk to a minimum. Uh, and then we'll open the floor to your questions. So our distinguished panelists are, starting uh, to the left, Monica Mackley, a communications consultant and pollinator advocate. She writes for the Texas Butterfly Ranch website and the Rivard Report, which is the San Antonio news website that she co-founded with her husband, Bob Rivard. We owe Monica a debt of thanks for organizing this inaugural Monarch and Pollinator Festival and enlisting the other members of this fine panel. Yes. Mm -hmm. Here, Monica. Beside uh, Monica, Dr. Cuauhtemoc Sainz Romero, is a forest geneticist at uh, Michoacan University. He has studied forests from the tropical areas near Puebla all the way to the snowy volcanic peaks in Michoacan. He's best known today as an expert on the oyamel, did I say that right? Mm -hmm. Oyamel, fir trees that protect the monarchs in their winter sanctuary. Next is Kathy Downs, a citizen scientist based in Comfort, Texas. She's been fascinated by monarchs since she saw them in her family's apple orchards in uh, rural Maine. And she's a certified match master naturalist and serves as a conservation specialist for Monarch Watch, teaching children as well as adults about butterflies and their host plants. Finally, Dr. Catherine Hayhoe saw her first monarchs in the woods north of Toronto in her native Canada. Today, she's an internationally renowned atmospheric scientist and director of the Center for Climate Change at Texas Tech. And the rumor is that Leonardo DiCaprio asked her for her autograph when they both were invited to the White House recently. <laughs> <laughs> Dr. Hayhoe's husband, Andrew Farley, teaches applied linguistics at Texas Tech and is the pastor of a local church. Both are evangelical Christians, and they recently co-authored a book called A Climate for Change, Global Warming Facts for Faith-Based Decisions. Uh, so please join me in welcoming this panel. Thank you for coming. I'd like to point out that we have representatives of all three countries that uh, get to enjoy the monarch migration, and we also have an equal number of esteemed scientists and citizen scientists, so we think we've got a pretty good balance here. Yeah. Now, I regret because of an illness that one panelist was not able to make it, and that is uh, Catalina Trail. Uh, but we are lucky that we have our good friend Monica here to channel her spirit um, and to walk us through her dramatic discovery of the monarch's winter home in Mexico not that long ago. Um, first, though, we'd like to enlist everyone here in a brief video to cheer Catalina's recovery. So do we have a camera handy? All right, here we go. Okay. Okay. No, Siri, I don't need your help. <laughs> All right, we're gonna, everybody's going to turn around and we're going to say, get well soon, Catalina, on the count of three. One, two, three. Get well soon, Catalina. Thank 
Thank you. She will really appreciate that. She was very disappointed to not be able to be here tonight. Mm -hmm. Catalina had a back surgery recently, and one thing turned into another, and so she was unable mm -hmm. to travel. Mm -hmm. And so um, I know we will try to get her, if we do this again, we will try to get her back here next year. I know a lot of people were very anxious to meet her, and I personally want her to sign my National Geographic magazine that I have. I, know <laughs> yeah. about, uh, yeah. I got a couple of those at home, so yeah. we'll try again sometime. Get us started, Monica. Talk to us about what Catalina discovered and its importance to well, what's, I think attention what's so, to the monarch. What's so amazing about her story, and I think why uh, so many people are captivated by it, is it is a story of uh, citizen science working with real scientists. And the way it worked was Dr. Fred Urquhart, who is the man who initiated much of the uh, initial research about monarch butterflies, who's from, I believe, Ontario, if I'm not mistaken, mm -hmm. Canada. Uh, he created this tagging program that we continue today way back when with these crazy little tags that they would put on the butterflies in Ontario and they were trying to figure out where these butterflies went because every year these butterflies would show up in Canada and they're like, what happened to the butterflies? Where did they go? And over many decades, he and his wife Nora tried to figure this out. They did all kinds of um, outreach, putting ads in newspapers, recruiting volunteers, like if you see these butterflies, you know, please contact us. Ultimately, over several years, uh, they, they realized the butterflies were going to Mexico, but they couldn't figure out exactly where they were. So they put an ad in the Mexico City News Recruit, which, is the, uh, which was the English language newspaper, week, I think it was a weekly, I'm not sure if it's still around, recruiting volunteers to uh, try and find these monarch butterflies. And Catalina's husband at the time, a man named Kenneth Brueger, who was an American who had moved to Mexico as an engineer, um, he decided to take this up as a because like, hey, let's do this. You know, let's go, let's go look for butterflies. And I'm like, are you crazy? That sounds insane. And so they ended up doing it. And they were going on the motorcycle <coughs> on weekends over a two-year period, trying to figure out where these monarch butterflies went. And they could tell they were getting closer and closer. And, the, and the, at the very end, as it, as they were as they got closer, and they were taking little uh, examples of the butterflies and going out in the campo into the mountains. And Catalina tells these stories of these long hikes, and they had a trailer and like parked their motorcycle and had all these adventures, flat tires, you can imagine. And they would show photographs of the monarch and say, have you ever seen one of these? And, and then people they ran, like, we've never seen that before. But they would see the butterflies. And so over a two year period, um, as they got close and they knew they were close, they started to even get paid for this. They got a stipend and were able to buy maps and all this. And so finally, uh, one day, they were in, uh, I believe, Cerro Pelon, which is uh, one of the monarch sanctuaries at this, at this time. And Catalina was the only person of the group, who, between her and her husband, who spoke Spanish, knew the native people, and was able to sort of navigate the landscape in terms of the culture. And so she did all the talking. And so she was the first one to the site. And I believe we have a, yeah, this photograph of her, which is it's just captivating. Um, she has several of these photographs, and I believe she may write her own book someday. But um, she was the first one there, and she's like, I found, we found them, we found them. And they took all these photographs, and they went back to make a long-distance phone call to Dr. Urquhart. And I believe it took them over a year to come down and actually see them, see the butterflies. They found the butterflies in 1975, but that National Geographic uh, story didn't come out until the following year in August, and which I always thought was weird. Like, <coughs> if I'd been searching for those butterflies all that time, I would have been on the next plane, but it was a different time. Um, ultimately, though, um, the story that got written, Catalina was sort of relegated to the cover girl role, and only recently has she really sort of gotten the recognition that she deserves. And it the way it happened was Catalina reached out to me at the Texas Butterfly Ranch website and said, I am the only living, I have, a, I have this email that she, uh, the comment that she left, I'm the only living person left from the original team that founded the Monarch oh. Roosting site, and I'd like to get involved. Oh in the Austin Butterfly Forum. And so I was like, when I saw this in my comments, I was like, oh, I can't believe she, that's her. Yeah. You know, mm -hmm. She's the one on the National Geographic cover. And I, I was like, are you here? And she was in Austin. I couldn't <laughs> believe that she was in Austin, Texas. <laughs> so I began this correspondence with her. I ended up going up to meet with her. We got to know each other over the last few years. We've stayed in touch. Excuse me, we've stayed in touch. And I actually went up recently when she was ill and we put a butterfly garden in her backyard because she was so sad that she couldn't see the butterflies this year. But her story is pretty amazing, mm -hmm. and um, mm -hmm. that's how I got that's how I got to know her, and I've, I've stayed in touch with her, and she's an amazing lady. Mm -hmm. It's amazing to think that it was only 40 years ago; it was still a mystery where they went. 
Yeah. Mm -hmm. 41, 41 years, years ago. ago. Yeah. Amazing to think about. Yeah. And if you haven't seen the IMAX movie, there's an IMAX movie that explains all of this, and it's really amazing. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Kathy, can you talk us through what's happened since then to the monarch population and to the size of the migration? Well, uh, we've got a chart. We started you, really. So. Oh, okay, good. <laughs> We started really estimating populations probably in the early 90s. And so by 1996 or so, we literally had a billion butterflies, a billion butterflies. So we estimate in hectares, um, not being able to count individual butterflies, uh, which would be quite a chore. Um, so we estimate in hectares. And uh, since 96, in the overwintering population of 2014, 15, we were down to 33 million butterflies. The interesting point about that fact is that in 2002, we had a major storm event, and we actually lost 33 million butterflies in that storm event, which was the entire population of that one overwintering year. So we have seen a very heavy decline over the uh, last few decades yeah. for that. Um, we can kind of attribute that to several factors, many factors really, um, one of them being uh, conversion of open space. Uh, we see a lot of it here in Texas, particularly being a focal point for migration. Um, the entire migration in the spring and the fall both, and spring during breeding times is coming up through uh, and laying as uh, for breeding populations coming through looking for milkweed. And then in the fall again, coming down through funneling back into uh, funneling back into Mexico uh, for overwintering. So these populations are relying on Texas resources and we've seen a huge amount of conversion in Texas alone. And by conversion you mean like ranch land or open land ranch to Ranch land and farming. open land being converted to uh, Weed, either or, yeah. crop or yeah. agriculture or development. Frankly, uh, right. Texas has really been sailing up in terms of uh, population increases, okay. particularly San Antonio, yeah. Austin, and the other metro areas. So we're seeing a lot of loss of open space. Yeah. So Can the milkweed's going away, the nectar's yeah. going away. So that's part of it. Another part of it is uh, agricultural, different uh, changes in agricultural use. So we're seeing glyphosate application in the summer breeding grounds of about 170 million acres of habitat there. Um, other agricultural issues such as pesticides and herbicides over the last few decades have also taken a huge toll on habitat. Um, so we see that factoring in also. Then we have um, overwintering areas which have lost huge uh, hectares worth of uh, the OML fir tree populations mm -hmm. that the uh, overwintering markets rely upon for survival there, some of that due to storm uh, damage and some of that due to, frankly, these people needing to uh, use some of the wood to live with. They, they don't have stoves and some of the things, that we, the things that we enjoy. And then some of that to illegal logging. So we have a, a multifaceted issue all converging on a serious loss of habitat. And that's why we see the decline we've seen here. Catherine, could you talk about another factor, which is uh, uh, global warming and climate change on, on the monarchs? So I'm a, making sure this is working, yes. I'm a climate scientist, and I specifically study what climate change means to us in the places where we live. So often when we think about climate change, the first image that pops into our head is not the monarch butterfly, it's not San Antonio, it's usually a polar bear, right? Mm -hmm. Sometimes yeah. sitting on a melting piece of ice. The reality, though, is that climate change is what, what the military actually calls it, a threat multiplier. So if we have a system under stress where that could be a human system, like a city, where we are always friendly water short, and when it rains, it rains too much, and when it doesn't rain, we have drought, our cities can be under stress, and our ecosystems can be under stress, as you've just heard from the butterflies. They're under stress because of the expansion of agricultural land, the expansion of urban areas, the use of herbicides and pesticides. This is a system under stress. Then along comes climate change and adds that one extra straw to the camel's back. And you know what they say about that extra straw. <coughs> That's why we care about a changing climate, 
not because it brings some new, strange, different challenge we've never seen before. We care about a changing climate because it exacerbates the threats that we already face today. And that's true for us as humans living here in Texas, and it's also true for the butterflies. Thank you. Kawaksimo, can you talk about uh, the effects specifically on the uh, OML furs? Yes. Um, why, one question that we can ask is, why monarchs go there to the uh, Oyamel Sacred Fair, Abis Religiosa scientific name, forest? It seems that they go there because it's the only place where they can uh, stay in a trade-off between a place where it's not too cold to get frozen in the winter, but not too warm to spend their lipid reserves that they have taken from here, from Texas. So they're in semi-hibernation when they're there? Yes, they almost, almost do not eat at Mexico. They drink water, but they mostly live on the reserves, the fat reserves that they take from here, from Texas. So if the place were too warm, they will spend too much lipids, and they will not make it for the comeback to, to, to Texas. To Texas. Uh, and in particular, this tree, the Oyamel, the, the crown usually, if the tree is healthy, and I want to come back to this issue, if the tree is healthy, is a very dense crown, cra crown that provides an umbrella effect. <laughs> the umbrella effect is important because uh, the winter in Mexico in that place is dry, but eventually it may rain. And if rain and the uh, monarch gets wet and the temperature goes below zero, it gets frozen. The, the winds get frozen and it dies. So the Oyamel provides protection against the rain of winter to uh, prevent uh, the monarch get too wet. And also it's a blanket effect prevent that the heat in the, of, the, of the ground get released to the sky at night, in the cold nights of the winter. So, and, and the protection is so huge that there is five degrees Celsius of difference, about 10 degrees Fahrenheit, between underneath of the crown of the Abies religiosa and outside in the open. So it's a huge difference of temperature. So it seems that it, why they go there. And uh, the, the challenge for, for us that we are at Mexico is uh, how to be sure that the forest will be healthy in the future since the, because climatic change, as you, as Catherine has explained, is changing of place. So uh, this slide that I, we have here is a mod, is after a uh, statistical model that we developed with Dr. Gerald Reffel. He's a researcher of Forest Service in Moscow, Idaho. Nothing to do with Russia, it's Idaho. <laughs> and uh, we um, established the relationship between the climate that happened, where are the black symbols. The black symbols are real population of the forest, of Oyamel forest the relation between the climate and the population, and the climate outside of these areas where do, do not happen the, the Oyamel. And then we projected the geographical space where it happened a climate that is good for these trees. We call it suitable climatic habitat, meaning the geographic space where happened a good climate for this tree. And when we have this model already, which is the green area, can we go to the next, please? Sure. We change the input of the data of the model with projections of climate of the Intergovernmental Panel for Climatic Change, IPCC, which is an international team that is working on climatic change. And we projected where, should, where is going to be this climatic space good for this species. So you can see that um, yellow is for 2030 orange for 2060, and red for 2090, it gets smaller and smaller. Why? Because the climate that is good for the trees is getting at higher altitudes. So it's like if the climate is moving upwards in the mountain. And the most worry part that has to be with the monarch is this panel that I have here at, the, at your left is an amplification of the monarch butterfly biosphere reserve. So the black line is the, the uh, limit of the biosphere 
Reserve of Monarch Butterflies in the border of Me Michoacan State and Estado de Mexico State. And please see that there is no a single pixel, not a single small square, red. Each pixel in this image is one square kilometer. So the fact that there is no a single red pixel means that by 2090, it will not be a single square kilometer with a climate good for the trees where the monarchs go to overwintering. But there are some nearby, right, in, in some of the other areas? In other, yes, but not, not in the monarch butterfly biosphere reserve. Right. So what happens if the climate has disappeared? The tree is going to be stressed. And a stressed tree uh, has a hard time and is easy prey of the attacks of insects like uh, pine beetle or uh, fungus like cronartium. Mm -hmm. A needle castle and a lot of other disease, and eventually will die. I think we've got a picture of one of the trees that's diseased uh, uh, on another yes, slide. Just, just let me, yeah, mm -hmm. Yes, that is a common thing that is happening. The upper part of the crown is death. Why is death? In Mexico, the rain in this area is mostly between uh, June and October. So in the dry season, December to May, uh, the, leaf, the tree has to live of the moisture that is on the ground. And now April and May, April and, April and May, uh, April and May is too warm. And there is no more moisture. It's whatever is left of the previous year rain. So the tree cannot pump water to the top of the tree. It pumps water up to the place where they can. So, and if the water is not pumped enough high, the branches die. So there is a, uh, this mortality of the upper part of the branch. If you go to Mexico next season of the monarchs, you may not see these trees any longer because they die and they are cut very quickly. And it's good they are cut because otherwise they may become a source of pest outbreak. So pine beetles kill the tree and then reproduce and go to the next tree and it's kind of a wave of expansion of the attack of the pine beetle. So it's needed to, to, to cut them. But of course, if we are cutting the trees, which is right to do in, in this case, the density of the forest is going slow, uh, small. It's, it's going to be less density of the forest. So this blanket effect and um, umbrella effect that I said is going to be less and less. So it seems that we have to do something that may sound radical. I'm, I may be crucified by some ecologists <laughs> in the future, which is to move the forest. Mm -hmm. To move the forest to a place where will happen the climate that is good for these trees. So can we, yes, to this slide, in the panel that I have here, it is uh, Iztaccíhuatl in the upper part, and in the down part is Popocatépetl. So are two of the highest volcanoes of Mexico. is uh, 5,000, near 5,500 meters of altitude. So I don't know how much that's in feet. I don't know you, why you use feet. <laughs> <laughs> Even the British, after yeah. the Brexit, used the meters. So I don't know. <laughs> 15,000, she says, yeah. and I believe yeah. she. I think we have okay. a slide of that peak that you're talking about a little further down in the slideshow. Right. So 15,000 yeah. uh, feet, it's a lot. So uh, we need plant Oyamel at higher altitude where it exists today in another volcano. Well, the Oyamel is already there. We have to move the population higher. And then hope, some people will say pray, to the monarch's change of of location over winter insights, which we don't know it will happen. Because as you, you well know, the generation that got to Mexico never had been in Mexico. It's not the case of uh, migra migratory birds, w where the young uh, birds follow the elder birds, and they don't have to do an anything other than follow the mother and follow the grandparent bird, and that's it. Here, the monarchs never have been there. So a three generation before or four, they were there. How do they, do they know? They, it seems that they have some genes that 
genetically control a system, a compass system that is corrected for the position of the sun along the year. And that is inherited. It's the only explanation that is known so far. Can this system be changed? Can the monarchs can learn that the trees now are dead and they have to search for another place for overwintering? We don't know. But I think, as I see my role in Mexico is do whatever is possible to have healthy trees in the future. That is my, my role, I think. If we are going to do, achieve that or not, I don't know, but we are going to try to do that and have healthy trees and see if the monarchs go there. And so the idea is to move the trees higher up where the temperature will be appropriate in future years yes, because, and have them ready. Yes, because we cannot move. Um, I have to stop. <laughs> We have uh, the, 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 this moving of the populations of the species, we call it assisted migration, meaning that uh, a tree can migrate, well, a tree can, it cannot walk. Don't say fly, they cannot walk. So how a population migrate? So they just can disperse seeds, but the seed arrives to the soil, it has to germinate, grow, compete with success, and then reach the sexual maturity at 20 years old, and then produce a new seed and disperse the seed. So the movement is very slow. It has happened OK during the retraction of the glaciation. When the uh, Wisconsin glacier <laughs> retracted, the vegetation followed. But it had 5,000 years to do that. We don't have 5,000 years. We have less than a century for this projection. So in this picture, I am standing in an experiment well, it's not evident, but this is, the, this is the fence of the experiment where we move populations upwards. So we collected seeds along an altitudinal transect, produced seedlings in the nursery, and planted in an experimental design. And we are waiting to see what happened. And in the right is a, a, a local a comunero, a collaborator, owner of the land. And behind him is a, the, one of the highest points of the Monarch bio, bio, Biosphere Reserve, El, Pic, El Picacho, 3,550 meters. I let Catherine how many does that in feet? <laughs> <laughs> OK, multiply that by three, you do the math. Yeah. And see that we don't have soil there. So we can go up to 3,500, but you, there is just rocks. So we have to change of mountains. And if we change the mountain to vol Mexican volcanoes like Popocatépetl, Iztaccíhuatl, Pico de Orizaba, still there is no organic soil because it's uh, above the tree line, the timber line. So when there are no trees, there are no litter. There are no dry uh, leaves on the, on the ground. So there is no organic and material input. So the soil is very poor because it's just uh, sand and uh, volcanic stones. So we may need to move the forest, and we may need to move the, the soil, which may, it may be possible, because in Michoacán, we are moving soil. For having your uh, um, guacamole in the day of uh, what is football game that you do on Thanksgiving? Super Bowl. Yeah. <laughs> the Super Bowl. Yeah. You may don't know, but it's our biggest holiday. Yeah. <laughs> the Super Bowl, yeah. For eating your guacamole at your Super Bowl day, Avocado was produced in my state, in Michoacán. And it's so good business to export to you the uh, guacamole that there is cultivating, they are cultivating now uh, avocado in places where there is no good soil. So avocado producers are renting trucks to move soils, good soil from one place to their uh, orchard and make a big hole, put the soil, and then plant the avocados to export um, mm -hmm guacamole for you. So <laughs> it may be possible yeah. to move the soil. Yeah. I don't know. What about the butterflies? I mean, the first time I heard you say, when we were talking on the phone, you said assisted migration. I pictured those dudes who dressed up like uh, whooping cranes mm -hmm. and you know, led them over and got in an ultralight and flew the ultralight. And the cranes followed the ultralight. I mean, it, can you get the butterflies to move to a higher peak, too? Uh, I, that that question, question is not for me. I think that's a good question. Uh, it kind of begs the question, though, how far do we go mm -hmm. to assist migrations? Mm -hmm. so we move the forest, and we move the trees, and then we move the butterflies. Yes. So we kind of need to 
I mean, I think about the Western, there's an entirely different population on the West Coast. Mm -hmm. So we have eucalyptus trees out there that yeah. these butterflies are surviving on, and the temperatures certainly are not in the teens mm -hmm. over there. And I think it's just amazing what kind of work you're doing out there. I know also that there's quite a bit of volunteer work going on with raising seedlings. Am I hearing yeah, that right? Yeah, some volunteer work. Okay, yes. and so do these new seedlings, I'm wondering, do the new seedlings go into some of the higher elevations or is that an effort that's ongoing? That part I don't know, but moving the butterflies I think is possible the butterflies would evolve to that. Now, I don't know for sure, and that's totally a, a straw argument, I think, or a, what do you think, something Kevin? I don't have data on. Mm -hmm. But Kevin. they've been known to evolve to do many mm -hmm. unusual things, and will they evolve to a higher altitude to follow the trees? I think probably they would. Mm -hmm. but what do you think? Well, that is what nature does. Nature is constantly changing and evolving. Um, but the main issue is the issue that you mentioned, the issue of time. Mm -hmm. So we have seen huge changes in our planet's climate in the past. Um, everybody who's watched those Ice Age movies know that there was an Ice Age that ended when a squirrel was chasing a nut and fell you off a glacier. You know that. <laughs> You're thinking the one with Jack Black, right? Yeah, was that Jack Black, the voice? Yeah. Oh, yeah. So, after the last ice age, there was a huge warming of the planet. That warming happened over 10 to 50 times longer than what we're seeing today. That was exactly what you were saying. So it's a question of time. If climate changes more slowly, will the butterflies adapt? I think the answer is yes, without a doubt. The question is really, can they adapt this quickly without help? And it isn't just the butterflies. There is many endangered species who people are asking the same questions about. In all seriousness, somebody just said to me the other day, should we just take the polar bears and move them to Antarctica? And I said, well, that's the end of the penguins. <laughs> I know. So this, we, we live in an incredibly unique time in this planet. We have 7.5 billion people. The Earth is divided up into parcels that we own and that we build on, and nature is reduced to these fragmented pathways that animals, butterflies, birds, mammals rely on for migration. And so the question is, to what extent can we help them? Because I think to successfully um, navigate the coming change, assistance is needed. And assistance is already happening. I mean, this is a story that is in, in no way as, as serious as the one that you shared. But in terms of trees, I work with cities. I work a little bit with San Antonio, a little bit more with Austin, and a lot more with uh, Chicago and Washington, D.C. And so in Chicago, for example, when a tree dies in a park there, they are now replacing that tree not with the same type of tree. They are replacing it with a tree that is native to 200 miles south of Chicago. Why? Because we've done the projections, and when that tree reaches maturity, that will be the climate in Chicago. Wow. So what he's proposing is not necessarily something that you may be crucified for, because people are doing that in other places. But it is difficult, because then people say, well, are you, are you um, interfering with nature? Well, the answer to that is, we have already interfered with nature. Remember that I live in Morelia, yeah, not in Chicago. Yeah. I will be crucified eventually. <laughs> <laughs> Kathy, can you talk about some of the, um, you know, the other types of help that the butterflies could use mm -hmm. as they migrate to. in the spring and in the I'd fall, the plants? Um, I think we have some slides of the plants here great. going to refer to. I mean, because of the conversion and all of the other issues that we spoke about in reducing habitat, there are a few great things that we can do to help them hopefully get to these OML fir trees in Mexico and back up to repopulate our continent. And one of these things is to plant the three species of concern here in Texas that we seem to be losing quantities of. Um, those are three milkweeds uh, that they'd be looking for in the spring. I mm -hmm. think that's what's up there now. Mm -hmm. um, in our area here in San Antonio and kind of a little further south, west and up, oh, I want to say almost as far as Austin and Blackland Prairie, we'd be looking at the antelope horn milkweed, which is that uh, Asclepias asperula. Does really well here. It's a roadside milkweed, really pretty easy to do by seed. Um, further east, if you're uh, in a little richer uh, 
soil base, uh, the green milkweed or the Asclepias viridis is going to be the milkweed for you. Um, the Anetheroides or the Zazotes is pretty widely distributed all through Texas. So if you could plant any of these three, uh, what we consider species of concern through Monarch Watch, these are the three species that could, you could plant no matter where you live in Texas, you could choose one of these three and they'd be adapted to your area. So that's going to help our breeding populations of monarchs if we can replace some of the milkweed habitat that they lost. So we'll be looking for milkweed in the spring. Um, in the fall, and I think I have some nectar slides up there. Not sure if he has some, yeah, there, there we go. go. Um, we really have to have fall blooming plants. Now, monarchs are coming through now. I'm sure some of you have seen them streaming through. They're kind of traveling through some riparian or river areas, but in the fall, they're generally not breeding. Uh, they're saving their energy to get down to overwinter in the OML fir trees in Mexico. So, so we're it's looking for, out. except for it's 90 degrees out, and they're streaming differently this year than they have been. They're coming so in waves. So it's all slower this year, right? Considerably slower and in waves. Normally it's a big event. Boom! They come down, they go through, they funnel into Mexico and it takes about 10, to two, 10 days to two weeks and they're done. But this year, they're still coming out of Kansas. They're still reporting monarchs coming out of uh, the East Coast. Ontario, even in Canada, they've had much warmer weather. We were talking about this earlier. Um, so we're going to see migration virtually happening for another four weeks into November. The other thing that I'm noticing, um, so we're going to need nectar straight through the end of October into mid-November if we're going to hope that these monarchs succeed in a migration into uh, Mexico. And that is new uh, for us to see this year with these warmer temperatures up north. So normally what would take two weeks is now going to take close to a month for them to actually all get down through here. <clears throat> but these nectar plants would be very useful uh, to have. They're also uh, easily available throughout most of Texas. Their distribution is pretty widespread through Texas. Um, some of them are probably familiar to you. Uh, the frostweed you love to hate or hate to love. But it is a crucial plant for them um, because they're all, it's one of the few, if not one of the only uh, animals that gain weight when they migrate. So it's really, really important that they have that nectar for fall. But I think we're going to be really seeing something different. We're hearing more and more about monarchs breeding in the fall. They're not supposed to do that. They're not reading the book. <laughs> They're supposed to be in diapause. They're supposed to have arrested their sexual maturity until March of next year in this generation. This migratory generation shouldn't be breeding. Mm -hmm. And yet we're hearing, I'm hearing a uh, lot of reports about new larvae, new eggs. Our milkweeds are still up and uh, our native milkweeds should be gone by now. So. I, th I think it begs a very interesting <clears throat> question about native plants that we, in the monarch world, and if there's any monarch gardeners here, I know you, you're familiar with this discussion about yes or no for tropical milkweed, which has been a plant that's kind of been vilified mm -hmm. by some of the monarch purists and uh, native plant purists. And for many, many years uh, before the monarch kind of got popular in the last two years because of all the uh, President Obama's pollinator strategy that was a national pollinator strategy that kind of raised the awareness for all of us. A lot of us were planting this plant, tropical milkweed, which is very easy to grow. It's a beautiful plant. It's Monarch's favorite host plant. We've done taste tests where we put five different kinds of milkweed on a table, and they always go to this one. And one Monarch, sci one monarch scientist told me, Bill Calvert, who was actually there in the beginning with Catalina and Dr. Urquhart, that this is the plant that monarch butterflies evolved on, and I'm assuming this plant is native in Mexico, and it grows, it's really easy to grow, and so you can find it anywhere, but there's some studies that suggest that uh, because this plant doesn't um, die to the ground in warm climates, and there's a certain spore that collects on the plant, and this possibly can affect the migrating population, and so I, yeah. I would be very curious to hear from the scientists about, when you talk about assisted migration, about moving <coughs> Forest, where do you draw the line about a native plant serving a purpose to feed migrating butterflies as a host? I mean, that just seems like a preposterous argument to me, but I would love to hear what the scientists have to say about the There's appropriateness of, of uh, tropical yeah, milkweed as a host plant in its yes. non-quote native uh, zone. 
I want, yes, before that, I want to come back to say that uh, I'm pleased to, to hear that in Chicago they are doing assisted migration. I didn't know that. Uh -huh. I know the only place where they were doing uh, massive commercial scale assisted migration is in British Columbia, in Canada. Uh -huh. You may know that the interior lands of British Columbia, they had a very strong uh, outbreak of pine beetles attacks that uh -huh. killed uh, millions of hectares of mm -hmm. uh, Pinus contorta, long, pole pine, well, it's Pinus contorta, the, the species. And now they are replacing the species with Larix occidentalis, which is another species that grows in drier lands at lower altitudes. So it's doing exactly what mm -hmm. you are doing in Chicago, but in a mm -hmm. flat land, there is a mountain. So they are moving Larix occidentalis to the higher altitude, and mm -hmm. it's working yeah. so far. Now about the milkweed, I don't know, I, because I don't know the, about the milkweed enough to answer your question, but it seems to me that we, we can move, we can plant oyamel, but we cannot move an ecosystem, especially mm -hmm. in Mexico. Mm -hmm. Mexico is the fifth biodiverse co country in the world. Mm -hmm. So it's only four more countries in the world that have more biodiversity than Mexico. So there is no way to move an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. you mo we may need to move an ensemble of species, a very simplified version of an ecosystem. Mm -hmm. Probably oyamel, a norse plant that protects the seedlings, mm -hmm. because in this assisted migration, we are targeting a climate of 2030 or 2060, but at present, that climate do not occur yet. Mm -hmm. and th that means that our seedlings planted could be killed by the frost damage. So we need to protect the, the tree uh, with a norse which could be a, a local uh, shrub, bush, shrub. A bush, shrub, mm -hmm. shrub. So then we may need to move an ensemble of species, including milkweed probably. But mm -hmm. I don't know the details of milkweed, mm -hmm. frankly. I think probably everybody here would like to know what we in this room can do, both about the big issue of you know, climate change and also in our own backyard. So, uh, Catherine, you were at the White House recently, no joke, with Leonardo DiCaprio and the president. And I know you've given a lot of thought to, you know, what are the best ways to uh, persuade and uh, mm -hmm. discuss this issue. So could you talk a little about that? Sure. So I mentioned before that the reason why we care about a changing climate is because it takes something that we already care about, that we're already concerned about, and it puts that extra straw on the camel's back. So in the case of the butterflies, there are already many reasons to be concerned. What is climate change doing to the butterflies? It's doing a few different things. It is actually changing their phenology. What does that mean? It means when they breed and when they migrate. You just heard firsthand witnesses of how things are changing, and they're changing because the warm temperatures are throwing off the butterflies' internal calendars. <laughs> We also see that the risk of storms is changing. And there was a devastating storm that I think you have a picture of here, a devastating storm just this past March that actually brought ice and snow to wear the monarchs winter and destroyed many of the trees. And I think about 70 acres of trees and who knows how many butterflies, how many butterflies? Somewhere between seven and 50%, depending yes, on who is reporting. Yeah, uh -huh. so huge numbers. Well. And that is part of what we see with the changing climate is we see that our weather is getting weirder. And in fact, I actually have a little uh, PBS digital series called Global Weirding right now. So if you're interested in finding out more, if you go to globalweirdingseries.com, there's a bunch of short little videos we have, and new ones come out every Wednesday where we talk about how things are getting weirder. Mm -hmm. We also see long term that climate change is altering where plants grow. And of course, the butterflies depend on certain plants. They depend on the trees. And we saw how one possible strategy is to move the trees to a higher mountain. They also depend on milkweed. And similar to the, the figure you saw about trees, I also have a figure about milkweed here. This is where milkweed um, typically grows today. And we do have milkweed here, but there's a lot more of it, as you see, up in the Midwest, up into Canada. And then over on the right-hand side, where milkweed would be most concentrated in the future. Do you mean the green? Yes, the, the green, green is, okay. the, is the high. So green and blue is high density. Mm -hmm. So you want it to be green and blue. Those, that's where you have a lot of milkweed. So it's impacting 
basically the butterflies are getting it left and right, top and bottom. Mm -hmm. I mean, they're getting it where they, where they go in the summer, they're getting it where they go in the winter. Mm -hmm. It's affecting their behavior, it's affecting their habitat. What can we do? There are two things that we can do when we see these types of stresses. The first thing we can do is to build resilience. And those are some of the ideas that we've talked about, planting milkweed here. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm planting trees that they can live on in the future in Mexico. That is building resilience, providing them with the, the tools, essentially, that they need to survive. But the second thing we can do, and this is something that all of us can do, is we can do what we can to try to make sure that climate doesn't change any more than it has to. <coughs> A certain amount of climate change is inevitable because of all of the coal and gas and oil that we've burned over the last 300 years. That is why climate is changing, is because we get most of our energy from what we call fossil fuels, literally fossil fuels because they're built from organisms, made from organisms that used to exist a long time ago, fossils. So we've been burning fossil fuels, and that has produced all kinds of heat-trapping gases that have built up in the atmosphere, and they're essentially trapping the Earth's heat like a blanket traps our body heat on a cold night. That is why the planet is warming. So a certain amount of change is inevitable and we have to prepare for a certain amount of change and build that resilience into our own social and human systems as well as into valuable and precious natural systems like the butterflies. But at the same time, we can act to wean ourselves off of fossil fuels. And that was what the Paris Agreement was about at Christmas. I don't know if you followed the news last December, but 195 countries from around the entire world, including the United States and China and India, all met together to say we want to limit warming to two degrees Celsius, that's three and a half Fahrenheit. Just for reference, we are almost at one degree Celsius, so we're almost halfway there today. And the awesome news is that all these countries around the world agreed on this and they're doing things like China has actually started to cut its coal use. China's coal use has gone down the last two years. India has decided to replace all their public light bulbs with LEDs that use hardly any energy. And here in Texas, we're doing amazing things. Here in Texas, last year, we got 10% of our energy from wind. This year, we already are getting 15% of our energy from wind. We have enough wind and solar potential here in Texas to supply the entire country with electricity. Hmm. And that's already happening. I mean, you've probably all heard about the little town of Georgetown, you know, just north of Austin. They're going 100% renewable or green energy as of next year because it's the cheapest way for them to get it. That's pretty awesome. Uh, Fort Hood up in Killeen, they're the biggest military installation in Texas and in the entire United States. They just signed a new contract for electricity that's all wind and solar. Why? Because they would save taxpayers $165 million by doing so. So we are on our way to fixing this problem. We just aren't quite doing it fast enough yet. <laughs> and we can't avoid all the impacts either. That's why there is no one perfect solution. We want to act to, uh, to accelerate this transition to clean energy that is already happening in Texas here today. But we also need to act to protect, again, those valuable and precious species that mean so much to us. Because some of the impacts we can't avoid. Mm -hmm. Quattamo, one so, question I get a lot mm -hmm. is, would it help if more of us went to the sanctuary? Would that help the economy in that area and allow people to you know, not log as much, not put mines there? Or would it hurt because it would damage the sanctuary if more people came? Good question. Tourism always has an impact on the environment, like uh, a little bit of erosion and things like that. But overall, tourism is very positive in that overwintering site mm -hmm. because the, there is se very severe, sever, severe, severe, mm -hmm. severe, severe, yeah. severe restriction to cut trees mm -hmm. today because it's a biosphere reserve in the core area. Mm -hmm. So the nearly the only income alternative to cut trees is to have ecotourism. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. So it's yeah. absolutely mm -hmm. important, and you can see mm -hmm. there are studies about that by a researcher at UNAM at Morelia, mm -hmm. Isabel Ramirez. They have map where are the um, uh, deforestation illegal in the Narbo de Fly Biosphere Reserve? And it's clear that the deforestation going on illegal is where there are no overwintering sites of the mm. monarchs because they don't have ecotourism. Uh -huh. So okay. people is poor. They don't have gas in, this, in the stoven, uh, stufa. 
yeah. the stove. stove. The stove. Mm -hmm. So they don't have gas. So they have to mm -hmm. use uh, firewood. Mm -hmm. right. And the places that are more protected is those where there are more ecotourism because they have a, 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 an alternative revenue. So mm -hmm. yes, if you go there, it yeah. helps, definitely. That's good to hear. I want yeah, to that go. is good to hear. Mm -hmm. yeah. I, I want to make a comment about what said Catherine, if that's OK. Mm -hmm. I am a little bit less positive, less optimistic in this way. Uh, the agreement of Paris, France, mm -hmm. the summit of climatic change, in this long document, there is a paragraph that says the technical, mm -hmm. technical committee expressed their concern that the voluntary reductions of each country are not enough. Oh, no. To, I mean, they're yes, not. It's they're clear. not enough no. to, to, to reach mm -hmm. um, to only two degrees of warming. So it's neither mm -hmm. more reduction as mm -hmm. it is uh, written down in the agreement. And there are cases uh, like Mexico where, sorry that I'm going to say this, but uh, the Mexican president went to Paris and said Mexico volunteered to reduce the uh, emission of gases of greenhouse effect by, I think he said, 30% by 2025 or something like that. Well, 2025 is very close. And in the coast mm -hmm. of Michoacán and Guerrero, in the border of Michoacán and Guerrero, there is a big facility of the Federal Commission for Electricity, Commission Federal de Electricidad, that burn coal to produce electricity. And because there is no coal there, the coal is imported from Australia. So Mexico is paying ships to bring coal from Australia, mm -hmm. transport to Mexico with emissions in, for the ship, and then burn the coal. And now is is getting this plant bigger. The facility is getting bigger to produce more electricity. And at the same time, as you may know recently, the, uh, the president and the party that is in power pushed to, for a change in the constitution to allow private companies, of course foreign companies, to drill, um, what do you say, Frack. pozos? Pozos? Frack. No, no, not the fracking. No. Uh, wheels? Wheels? Oil wells. Oil wheels in the deep sea of mm. Mexico mm. to extract petroleum of the deep sea. Mm -hmm. in the deep sea. Uh, so it's what we call go to the last drop of mm -hmm. oil. Mm -hmm. So I cannot understand how can we, Mexico, achieve a reduction of emissions mm -hmm. of um, gases of uh, greenhouse effect if we go to the last drop and we import coal from uh, Australia. Mm -hmm. So it's needed, in the case of Mexico at least, and, and very good that in Texas mm -hmm. you have this power, uh, wind power production, uh, we, is we need to change the, the, the way that we produce electricity. Mm -hmm. Monica, another uh, issue in Mexico, of course, is the copper mine that they want to reopen inside the sanctuary. Can you tell us a little mm -hmm. about that? Well, Guatemoc, you might know more, but what we've heard uh, here, and that's the petition that we uh, invite you to sign that we have uh, going here for the mm -hmm. Texas Butterfly Ranch and for the Monarch Festival tomorrow. There's a, a company in Mexico called Grupo Mexico, which doesn't have the best record environmentally. I think it actually has one of the worst environmental records in the country in the history of Mexico. And they had a permit to have a copper mine in, I believe, Angangueo, which is one of the number one destinations where you go to go to the monarch roosting sites from mm -hmm. there. And they let that permit sit dormant for many years, and in the meantime, the the monarch sanctuaries were established, and now they've decided that they want to reopen this copper mine, and they feel that they deserve to be grandfathered in because they had the permit before the sanctuaries were established. And so there's, a, there's some sort of discussion going on in Mexico, which I have mm -hmm. not been able to follow very closely. Uh, Guatemala, you might know more, but we yeah. ask that you sign mm -hmm. the petition, and we're, we're working with um, the Endangered Species Coalition to submit that to uh, the governor of Mexico. Mm -hmm. Yes, I, I think it's a, it's a silver mine, uh, mine. and um, what they are claiming, the company, as far as I know, because I, I don't know the much details, but what they are claiming is that the mine is going to be underneath. It's not going to be this open sailing mine, and they are asking a permit to change the use of the land of the opening of the, of the mine. And they say, well, the environmental impact is going to be very small because it's just this opening and all, all the rest activities are going to be underneath. But of course, the, the uh, tunnels are going to be flooded 
with mm -hmm. water. Mm -hmm. So they need to pump the water outside mm -hmm. of the underneath uh, underground mm -hmm. mine. And that is going to have a huge impact on the hydrological equilibrium of the forest. So, yeah. so far, is uh, we don't know what will happen. So they, they have, some, have some permit that says, yes, go ahead. And they do not have still other permit. But of course, the, the social pressure, and especially Mexican government is very sensitive to the opinion of United States. So if so you sign the petition, please. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. I yeah. think that's a good time to open the floor to questions. Uh, anyone have anything for our, our panel? Yes, ma'am. I have a lot of questions. <laughs> I can answer that. Good yeah. question. Well, well. There is a paper in Forest Ecology and Management, a scientific journal made by Allen. Allen is a researcher here in Forest Service in Colorado, I think. He's documenting what he calls a forest decline. Forest decline means a massive death of trees in a process that is the trees are debilitating for the uh, summers too dry and too warm. The tree defoliates and then is attacked by insects and pests. And that is happening all over the world. But it's not clear the pattern because the pattern of mortality happens usually at the low altitudinal limit of a species. Let me explain this. Let's say that this is the mountain in Mexico and this is the dis altitudinal distribution of a species. In the upper part, the dis natural distribution of a tree, like Oyamel, is limited by low temperatures. And in the lower part, is limited by the drought stress in the, summer, in, the, in the dry season. So it cannot go down in the altitude because it's too dry. So what happens is that the climate is moving upwards, but these forests stay there. So in the lower altitudinal limit of the distribution of each tree species is happening a declination already all around the world. So in, in Morocco, in, in the mountains of Morocco, is a massive dying of a, um, Cedrus Atlantica, a beautiful cedrus that is a huge cedar tree. tree right? mm -hmm. A cedar tree. Yeah. A cedar tree. Yeah. Is, the, is the tree that is in the flag of Lebanon. And in Mexico, it's happening in Michoacán, in the uh, Purepecha Plateau, where I have experiments. In the low altitudinal limit of the most important pine tree, which is Pinus pseudostrobus, trees are dying. And Oyamelas are, some trees are dying, as I show in one of the pictures. So the mortality of trees is going on. So you said, what if we do nothing? We will be witnesses of the dying of the, of the forest. Yeah. That is what would happen. But if I could ask a follow-up question on that yeah. specific to the butterflies, because mm -hmm. you've, got a, you've got a stationary population of them mm -hmm. in Florida, right? And in some parts of Mexico, mm -hmm. there are populations that don't migrate. There's a population in California yeah. that migrates short distances, which doesn't seem as affected mm -hmm. by this. So is it, is it that the butterfly would go extinct or that they'd stop migrating? Mm -hmm. I don't know. I, I, mm -hmm. Do you want to say something? Well, I just wanted to say that, that first of all, there, there is a, a, a petition right now that, that has been submitted by several environmental organizations to, to list the monarch butterfly as an endangered species. Mm -hmm. And that happened um, after that year when we had such a small population, 34 million. And a, a lot of people uh, agree that there's, no, there's really not a huge chance of the monarch butterfly going extinct because there's monarch populations all over the world. But what is it definitely at risk is the monarch migration as a phenomenon. So if we do nothing, I would, I would wager, as someone who pays attention but is not a scientist, that the monarch migration will cease to exist at some point. That doesn't mean we won't have local populations. We already have local populations of monarch butterflies, in, as uh, Dan said, in Houston. We had a population right here on the, on, at the Milkweed Patch on the Riverwalk for 10 months one year until we had a freeze. So. You know, is that the worst thing in the world? And I've asked this to several scientists, and I've never been able to get anybody to, well, first of all, why do insects migrate for shelter, for host plant, to reproduce? And if the monarch butterfly can have local milkweed and mates here in San Antonio or Houston or Florida, why should they migrate? Why would they migrate? I, 
I'd is like that, to speak to is, that let me, just, just, when you're finished. Is it, a, is sure. it a vanity for us as human beings to expect this insect to make that journey so that we can be marveled, so that we can appreciate it? And I mean, what would the butterfly say if we could interview the butterfly? <laughs> Okay, and I, I, I think that's a really good point, and mm -hmm. I, I understand what you're saying about that, but I think that if you look at it from a species angle, then you would be essentially involving the species itself, because the migratory behavior of this particular insect sets it apart from other populations of like insects. So we know that mm -hmm. the snout, for instance, was migrating east to west, pursuing other females. And we know that we have non-migratory uh, monarch populations in some of the island nations like Australia and so forth. And so yes, we, it is possible that we could have a non-migratory monarch population, but aren't we then losing the species that we were trying to sustain? So. I think we can sustain a migratory population. We'll never sustain it in the kinds of numbers that we might like to see, but I think that by applying good conservation and applying some smart uh, habitat restorations that we can sustain a migratory population. Personally, I think it's important, and I'm all for the vanity of that. Yeah. These, are, <laughs> these are magnificent, exciting, yeah. I mean, just really unique species. And if they need to evolve to be, they've already evolved to be non-migratory in other areas. Mm -hmm. And well, so, and just, if, to be, and just to be clear, yeah. I'm, the, I'm the biggest fan. I mean, yeah, I would I hate to see this go away, yeah. but I have to say that I she ask myself. She just likes to make an argument. I have to yeah. 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 I think about that a lot, about, yeah. okay, well, if I, if I ever have grandchildren, are my sons listening? If, if I ever have grandchildren, um, will I ever be able to take my granddaughter or grandson sure. to do yeah. this? And, you know, I don't know. Maybe we will, maybe we won't. Yeah. If we had a local population, we wouldn't yeah. be tagging butterflies. Yeah. There's a lot of things that would be lost. And, yes, there's so many incredible things that we project onto this phenomenon, spirituality, politically, um, Socially, you know, we're connecting with each other through this. Look at all the people in this room from mm -hmm. all over the country, you know, from Mexico, Canada, mm -hmm. New York, everywhere. So here we are talking about this very complex issue through a butterfly. It's mm -hmm. pretty amazing. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Catherine, I think you've made the point, too, that, uh -huh. you know, charismatic, iconic species like polar bears, like butterflies, can serve a larger purpose. Can you yes. talk to that? Exactly. I think that the answer to the question of can we do this? Mm -hmm is really how much of an extra burden is climate change going to add to this? Mm -hmm. um, if we are just dealing with the situation we have today and the stresses we have today, can that be fixed? Very possibly it can because as you can see, people are aware of the issues. They're on mm -hmm. top of them. They're coming mm -hmm. up with ideas. But the more climate changes, not just the more the monarchs will be at risk, the more all species will be at risk. If we continue on the pathway that we've seen over the last few decades in terms of how much fossil fuels we've been using and how fast we've been increasing mm -hmm. that use, we're, we aren't just going to be looking at the loss of migratory butterflies. We are going to be looking at about 30% of the world's entire species going extinct by the end of the century. I mean, that is huge. So it's hard to even wrap our minds around that type of scale of change. And at this point, you know, you kind of feel like, well, am I just trying to slap band-aids on a leaky bucket here? No, we aren't. But the issue is that we, we have to build the resilience here in the places where we live. We have to build resilience for the butterflies along their migratory pathway, but we have to look at the big picture at the same time. Um, last year, I got a chance to actually go up to the Arctic with the scientists who study the polar bears. These are the guys who tag the bears, who track the bears, who know the bears by name. I asked one of the scientists there, as a joke, how many times have you given a polar bear mouth-to-nose resuscitation? Mm -hmm. And he stopped and thought about it, and he said, I think 11 times. Oh, my wow. goodness. I said, what? <laughs> <laughs> so when they first Yikes. asked me to go, though, when they first asked me to go up to the Arctic, I said to them, I have to be honest with you, my work focuses on people. I work with people because I am very concerned about how the poor and the vulnerable among us here in Texas, as well as on the other side of the world, are already bearing the brunt of the impacts that we're seeing on our food, on our water, and our health. And they said something to me that I'm never going to forget. They said, we care about the polar bear care because the polar bear is showing us what will happen to us if we don't heed their mm -hmm. warning. Mm -hmm. And I think we could say the same about the butterfly today. 
Well, that question certainly kicked off a conversation. <laughs> yeah, exactly. <laughs> so, one more yeah, question, and then I'll check this to the end. <laughs> yes, ma'am. Mm -hmm. well, so, I do want to, getting to that, about questions about adaptability and hope. You know, this eucalyptus in California was not there 100 mm -hmm. years ago. It was not. So, we know that, mm -hmm. we know that the species has... Mm -hmm. yeah. Uh, hello? It's not on. <laughs> we know that the species has an ability to adapt. Mm -hmm. And the question is, you know, about the trees. You, you talk about how specific they are and how special they are. Mm -hmm. Can you talk about the limitations on getting individuals to a different site where they may learn or have a memory or there be some maybe epistatic effect on genetics that could... You were talking about moving the individuals of the butterflies to new oh, okay. places where they may... Yeah, there's a sort of experiment. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> testing, testing. There we go. Uh, yeah. One more time, Kelly. The question is, uh, we know that the species has been able to change its use of trees in California because the eucalyptus didn't exist there 100 years ago. And Cuauhtémoc and I have talked about the, the limitations on getting butterflies in Mexico to different habitats where they mm -hmm. might be able to take mm -hmm. advantage of different kinds of trees or at least have some sort of adaptation or flexibility, plasticity that would allow them to do that. So I think yes. people would like to understand the limitations on that. Yes, we would like to do a sort of, again, radical experimentation, meaning go in the overwinter and season, cut branches full of monarchs mm -hmm. and put inside a truck <laughs> with a cooler <laughs> and move to Popocatépetl, Istasiwat, volcanoes and release yeah. the monarchs and see yeah. if some will come back. We cannot tag them because we know that they will not come back. They will die in Texas, I think. And we don't have the funding and we don't have the permit to do that. We would be glad to have both. Wow, mm. interesting. Yeah. It is. I know that it's risky and you see why I will be crucified. Yeah, but <laughs> now I see. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Butterfly kidnapping. Uh, one thing more about the grandsons. Uh, you can tell your son <laughs> that grandsons are easy to order, so to, to request one. I know that because I have two grandsons. And I think this is the bottom of the issue. Is climatic change is a transgenerational issue. Mm -hmm. So maybe your grandsons, if there are, uh, may, may see the butterflies in Mexico. But the grandsons of your grandsons, likely not. Yeah. And that's the issue. We are uh, uh, releasing CO2 and other gases of greenhouse effects today mm -hmm. that will affect the grandsons of your grandsons and my grandsons. So that's the, that's the difficult part to, mm -hmm. to deal with. Okay. I think we had another question back here. Uh, you know, sorry, uh, I think far back in the back uh, was I'd like really? you to talk a little bit more about pesticide use. It seems to me um, that would be an immediate mm -hmm. benefit. You know, how much uh, uh, degradation are we talking between pesticide use on an annual basis mm -hmm. and climate change? And herbicide use as well, I think yes. you said. Yeah. Yeah. Um, well, I can tell you that if, if you, go ahead. you want me to go ahead with this. Um, if you're talking about gardening use, I think one of the things we really have to be careful of is that when we are pulling nursery plants, that we vetted our nurseries. Um, there are certain types of pesticides that are actually vascular in nature, meaning that they go through the entire uh, vascular system of the plants, from the roots all the way to the nectar. And so neonicotinoids are one that is uh, fairly well known now. Um, and can stay in the vascular nature of that plant for 120 days or more. Mm -hmm. And so you're essentially killing those pollinators and other mm -hmm. uh, butterflies and insects that you're trying to attract to the garden. So we have to vet our nurseries. We have to know that our nurseries aren't spraying those pesticides. Is there a site we can go to, Kathy, to um, Actually, there are, uh, well, uh, I'm sorry? A list of nurseries. I do have a list of nurseries, and mm -hmm. I don't have it on the resource sheet. I do have a list of websites here, but um, I can leave my cards. I'd be happy to electronically send you that list of nurseries. I didn't bring that website with me. Um, really maybe bad. Monica could put it on her yeah, site. Yeah, we could put yeah. it on the website. That'd be great. Yeah. Yeah. I'd be yes. happy to post that document yeah. for you. So we have actually vetted nurseries um, for milkweed and nectar plants mm -hmm. um, through Bring Back the Monarchs to Texas. And so we've, we've managed, uh, we're still looking for 
nurseries in the Houston area seems to be a void for us. So, um, but Austin, Dallas, San Antonio, Hill Country, we've got you pretty well covered there. So, um, but yes, and and there are other pesticides that only that they say are water soluble. There are pesticides that they say, oh, it'll wash off in five days. You can a pesticide is to kill insects. Okay, no matter what they want to call it, no matter how organic they say it is, its single purpose is to kill insects. So, mm -hmm. yes, keep that in mind when you're buying your next Yes, ma'am, over here. Back to the gardening question that Monica asked, and I'm sorry if you all said the answer, but is the tropical milkweed good or not? Yeah. <laughs> tropical milkweed's a great plant. It's a, good, it's a great plant. So, we, um, Go ahead. Uh, we call it cat food, caterpillar food, and you know, just today we were talking about. Kathy brought some caterpillars for the Monarch Festival tomorrow. She forgot her milkweed plants, so you know, we're going to go down to the milkweed patch over here, which is all tropical milkweed. Sorry, Lee, and uh, cut a little bit for our caterpillar friends so they have something to eat until tomorrow. But you know, there's um, a really good Monarch Joint Venture has some really fantastic resources, and there are some risks to having large colonies of overwintering tropical milkweed. Some of this has to do with monarch breeding or not breeding during fall migration, interrupting migration, some parasites and protozoan diseases. And these are all risks. I love tropical milkweed, don't get me wrong. It breaks my heart to cut this stuff down in October. When it's blooming, it's a lovely plant, but there are risks associated with it. So if you're at the event tomorrow, I'll have those handouts at the table. I'll also have my nursery handouts at the table tomorrow, um, but we'll post that anyway. But um, just read up a little bit on it. That's all I'm asking is see what the science says and see what the research says. And um, I think you all have to make your own judgment about how you want to handle your tropical milkweed. I cut mine because I just don't like to, I'm not a risk taker. Okay. So. so you're saying that if you have it and if you cut it down in the fall, mm. that's the way to keep it safe? That's the way I keep it safe. Okay. And those are the decisions that I made mm. um, okay. on, the, on that score. But everyone right. has to make their own decision. I made my decisions based on certain facts that I found. I think we had one on the second row here. Was there someone here? Oh, same question. Yeah. Because of the fungus that it produces in the fall that causes issues with the Well, it, I think that it's certainly, you know, in, in humidity there's a fungus, but it's actually a protozoan that um, seems to be more prevalent in uh, tropical milkweed than in other milkweeds. Because our, our native milkweeds generally tend to go by at this time of year. They're not present to be... Um, tempting to uh, non-breeding monarchs saying well, except when it's 90 degrees but it's 90 <laughs> degrees and I know that you have lots of swamp milkweed out at the ranch that's doing beautifully and um, and I know there was lots of late reemergence of milkweed this year and so mm -hmm. things are acting differently and the monarchs are acting differently because of it mm -hmm. um, but the tropical is just a sort of separate issue on its own um, acting differently than any other native milkweed that we had. It will just flourish all year round if you let it in San Antonio. Ma'am, you said you had a lot of questions. I think you're good for your word here. Do the two or three milkweed plants that I put in my yard make a difference, or do they need to be in mass? If you plant it, they will come. I have seen a milkweed this big in drought years with three eggs on it. I have seen a milkweed in Tim Horton's parking lot with in a median strip with a caterpillar on it. So does it happen I mean, right frankly, away or do they have to? I have I seen mean, balcony how do they gardens. Smell it? Do they smell it? Do they? They sense the milkweed with their antenna. They taste it with their feet. So yes. So it both, takes time for them to discover it in the root? It will take some time. Wait, they have taste buds in their feet? They taste with their feet, yes. Wow. They'll drum the plant. I'm so glad we don't Isn't have that. Isn't that great? <laughs> I think that's great. They smell with their antenna. <laughs> So going their back to, a lot to my years. initial question, <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> they have many, many scales on their feet. Are we preventing adaptation by, I know we are, we're the cause for the change, but are we preventing adaptation, going back to, I think it was the second question, about by interfering, by moving trees, by planting them where we wouldn't normally have it, are we interfering with adaptation? We're trying to accelerate it just because the time frame over which they have to adapt mm -hmm. is abnormally fast. And in the past, when there's been very abrupt climate change in the past, naturally, 
there have, that very abrupt climate change has been accompanied by mass extinctions. Mm -hmm. so. but, is that a, but is that a bad thing? I mean, we don't have mastodons today. I, I, I guess I'm just going True. back and forth with Well, I, I, think, the, I think the perspective right. often that um, I have is, if it were going to happen naturally, it was going to happen. But if I did it, do I really have the right to do that? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Okay. I think we had one just yeah. over here. forest, the overwintering forest, and uh, let's see, is that on? Um, what other, I have a few questions, mm -hmm. what other trees are part of the tree, the forest other than the Oyamal fir tree, and, or are there other trees, mm -hmm. and is there a plan for reforestation of that area as the Oyamal trees die? Well, the, the reforestation is going on already uh, every year in the perturbed areas, but without good control of the seed source origin. So, uh, for so far, there is a completely free movement of the seeds. I uh, meaning that uh, you plant is the the reforestation is done with seedlings, and no matter where is the origin of the seed. And for us, mm -hmm. it's important to collect seeds from one place, know what place is that, produce the seedlings in the nursery, and we have estimated based in our models that to realignate the forest to the 2030 uh, climate, we have to move upwards 300 meters. 300 mm -hmm. meters because the, ex mm -hmm. the projection indicate for Mexico, independently of the pessimistic or optimistic emissions of CO2, is uh, 1.5 degree higher temperature than a period of reference 6190. So uh, 300 meters will compensate 1.5 degree. So we need to know that pl planted seedling at 3,100 meters come from seed collected at 3,000 meters. So, and that is not happening. So um, about, well, that was to answer your question. Well, I, I went to another point. Kind of sort of, I'm, I'm really trying to Ah, the other ground. species. What is the, yes, the, the composition. Forest? Yes, okay. What is the existing okay. forest going to look like in 50 years as it gets too hot and the existing trees uh -huh. are dying? What other varieties sure. are going to naturally be there? Okay. Or is there a plan for reforestation of other varieties that aren't there naturally? Yes. And is there a possibility that the monarchs might overwinter? on those varieties in that same location? Okay. Or is that not even possible? It would uh, be too warm. Yes. Too warm for the butterflies. Yes. Think, right? Then or they couldn't go into the semi-hibernation, right? They'd be burning fat. Yes. Wouldn't be able to migrate. That is an issue. Yeah. To respond in the species composition, Oyamel, Avis religiosa, grows in an extremely narrow climatic space. In, in the mountain, it's a very narrow band. Uh, the main uh, <coughs> populations dominated by Avis religiosa are between 3,000 and 3,300 meters of altitude. It's a kind of narrow band. Mm -hmm. Above that, there is another pine that is uh, Pinus harvegi that is go, that go to the tree line, the timber line. The timber line in Mexico at that place is 4,000 meters. And below the Avis religiosa is Pinus pseudostrobus. The fact uh, is, uh, well, Pinus elostrobus is the more commercial pine species in, that, in Michoacan. The fact is, when uh, monarchs arrive, they uh, start in the low part of the mountain, but they stay like two days, three days, one week, and then move up, 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 and arrive to the Avis religiosa forest between 3,000 and 3,300 meters, and stay there in the colder season, uh, December and January. And they don't like the pines. Why we believe that is, when well, it's not we believe, it's what the studies of uh, Lincoln Brower has demonstrated this um, blanket and umbrella effects. So the blanket and umbrella effects <coughs> seems that is not enough in, uh, mm. under the um, crown of the pines. The pine that is above Avis religiosa is um, Pinus harvegi. Uh, it's very cold site, so the trees are very sparse. So it's not dense forest. Mm -hmm. The trees are short, and the needles are very uh, uh, small and kind of. So it's not a very dense crown. It's not a good blanket. So yes, mm -hmm. it's not a good blanket. It's not a good umbrella. Mm -hmm. And so, 
just okay. monarchs don't like the pines mm -hmm. in there. I, I don't, I, I'm surprised that they like the eucalyptus that comes yeah. from Australia. <laughs> but the fact is, in the overwintering sites in the volcanic axis of Mexico, they go to the abyss. So I, we think we need to move the abyss. Mm -hmm. Seems that uh, wherever is going to be the abyss is going to be this narrow climatic space to do not spend the fats too fast. Too, too fast. It's a kind of game of words in English. <laughs> in Spanish, it's easier. And uh, do not get frozen with the uh, winter uh, rains. Okay. I think we have time for one more. Yes, sir. Um, thank you all very much. Uh, this has been very interesting. Um, looking at the solutions that I'm seeing being proposed, they all seem to be bottom-up solutions, you know, resources to allow monarchs to survive and expand. But we know from the biology that predation on the, the monarch eggs and larval stages is you know 90 something plus percent, and indeed in some places, in, particularly as it heats up, it becomes 100 percent. So I'm just wondering, are there any concurrent studies looking at how climate change will expand this predation pressure? Because there's really no point in planting milkweeds and moving trees if the paper wasps and invasive ant species expand faster than the range of your host plants and overwintering sites. Great question. Great yeah. question. yeah, that is a great question. Um, Frankly, there has been no increase in predation for some time. So it remains at 97% um, in terms of data that I'm, that I'm seeing from the University of Minnesota. This is 97% of the eggs? 97% mortality. Okay. So we're looking at a general rule of mortality. There, Monarch population, when you're laying, when she's laying 200 eggs, 97% of that population is going to die. Before it becomes a butterfly. That's correct. Okay. So either through predation of the egg or predation of the larva, the caterpillar. But it's been 97% mortality, 3% per survival for some time now. And I haven't seen an increase but, but um, that, in but, that data. But that's at a, that. That's at a very fixed site where they're doing their studies? Mm -hmm. No, sir. Um, that's on quite a few sites, uh, somewhere in the vicinity of several hundred sites uh, all across the United States reporting but, data. That's citizen science data, though. So right. But, well, just mm -hmm. yeah. within the margin of error of those studies. I'm sorry? A, a few, uh, the margin of error of those studies, just a very a small change. And the math is pretty easy to do. A small change. And those predation numbers can have okay. a huge impact. Right. And that, that's, that's um, well, this is the region where modeling could be very effective yep. because it's not, well, we can continue this, this later. Okay. Yeah. Okay. I was going to say that. Okay. Well, well, I mean, I think that I was going to say the mm. all, only alternative I see is butterfly farming. So, I mean, if that's an alternative um, to predation numbers. I don't know that we could do that effectively and and remain um, in in control of a population through butterfly farming. I don't know if we could make up those kinds of differences. I was going to suggest that uh, it would be great to continue this conversation online. And Monica, what is the URL for your site? Oh, TexasButterflyRanch.com. So it's please lower, take lower. your questions there and, and your Texas comments. And thank you all for coming. Thanks to our panelists. Thank